morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, good morning. A very good morning to all of you. How is it going, guys? The Ian is here today. My manager, my little tiny weenie weenie manager. The Ian's been busy. It's like she hasn't been around for a bit. But that's all right. <sighs> How's everyone's week been? Uh, busy week as usual. I've been super overwhelmed for the past week or so. Uh, even though I supposedly was getting arrested, but I didn't even exactly get arrested. To be honest, I just do a lot of stuff that I usually don't do, like actually going outside my house. <laughs> yeah. All is good, all is good. Just gonna chill for a bit while waiting for people to come in. And yes, if you, if you notice, there's no more ara ara because apparently it's not working. Um, <laughs> so I'm never gonna give anyone any more ara aras. Just follow me. I'm your cult leader. Everything is good. How's everyone been? Uh, there's no everyone actually, there's just one person here. The end, how are you? How have you been? Let me know. What are you doing? Heard that you have been cycling a lot lately? So, yeah, enjoy nature. Don't be like me. Just sit at home all day. I have some great pictures of a morning. Like yesterday's morning clouds. I'm gonna post it on uh, my Twitter later. It's very nice. It's very anime. Like I had a super anime moment yesterday morning when I woke up before I head out for an appointment the, the clouds insane it looks like a v it's lo it looks it, it literally it's weird right because like people say uh, Makoto Shinkai's anime looks very realistic but when I look at the clouds all I can think of is oh my god this would this is exactly what Makoto Shinkai would have in his movies you know Do you guys know who is Makoto Shinkai? The one... I'm pretty sure you guys know. I don't know, sometimes you guys know the names of the movies, but you guys don't know the people who make it. You know? I have doubts that you guys know who is Makoto Shinkai. <laughs> He's a director of your name. Uh and uh weathering weathering with you. Like he's like 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 the up and coming uh 
animator basically but you know what you know what guys oh my god i feel so i always feel so boomer when i when, I, when it comes to this i watched makoto shinka when he made five centimeters per second and then i stopped watching him because while it's nice and poignant uh his style is just not my style of anime uh but i really appreciate his art style um just not his uh character art style his character art style is always weird Uh, it the his character art style. Uh, if you watch five centimeters per second, the character the character looks so out of out of place from the background. But I really uh love uh, Makoto Shinga's um depiction of nature of 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 uh landscape and everything. It I just don't like his character art style. His character art style is not good. Um, uh, sorry. Storytelling wise, I can't say much from Makoto Shinkai because I never watched your name because I hate it when people overhype shit and when they overhype shit, I don't watch them because I'm a fucking hipster. Um, so I never watched Weathering With You, I never watched uh, uh, Your Name, never watch. I The only Makoto Shinkai film I watched is uh, 5 centimeters per second which, which was made in like mid, mid 2000s I guess. I'm old school as fuck, okay? Um, but yeah. I know people will be like, people who love your name and weathering with you will be like screaming when they hear that, oh, I've never watched it, either of them. I'm like, oh, you're missing out! No, I'm not. I just choose not to watch it. You know what you guys are missing out? All the movies that I love to watch, you guys are missing out. <laughs> you know what you guys are missing out? Everything everywhere all the time. Watch that movie right now. Like I'm not even fucking kidding. It made me cry and then laugh and then cry and then laugh and then laugh crying, crying, laughing, laughing, crying, laugh. And then I was I got so tired by the end of the day because I was cry laughing so much. That I just went zombie mode after that, I think. <laughs> Watch everything, everywhere, all the time. The one with Michelle Yeoh. Alright, guys. Watch it. It's a great movie. Top 10. Top 10 of my favorite movies in my lifetime. Lifetime, okay? And I'm fucking old. Alright? <laughs> I'm just talking to n nobody. Basically, just talking to uh, the end. And uh, I know Zapox is here somewhere. I don't know who else is here. Um, maybe some robot. Usually, there's a bot here. Like one viewer bot, you know. Right. <sighs> anyway. If you guys still have everything everywhere all the time in your cinema near you, watch it right now. Watch it! Anyway, it's almost time for reading. Oh yeah, by the way guys. <laughs> Aww. I miss Strudel. Silly boy. Silly, silly boy. I have talked to Strudel, so don't worry, guys. He just needs his time to come back to stream. Uh, but that wouldn't be anytime soon. Uh, don't worry about him. He's fine. He's alright. Hey, good morning, Mia. Good morning, Mia. I'm just ranting about shit. Um, Mia, do you know who is Makoto Shinkai? You, you see, that's the thing, right? Like, people know, like... I want people to pay attention to the movie makers, the filmmakers. You know? 
instead of just the story. I'm pretty sure you guys have watched Makoto Shinkai films. Mia, I'm talking to Mia specifically. Mia is a a, a lurker, scary lurker. He doesn't talk much. Oh shit! My god, my pen. Guys, you know Japan, ha, like the pilot. Um, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Do you know who is Makoto Shinkai? Don't Google it. Don't Google it. Don't Google it. Do you know who is Makoto Shinkai? I tell you two films that he made, and then you will be like, "Oh my god, I'm a fan of his films." Okay, your name and weathering with you. And you guys don't know who made it. I'm pretty sure you guys. I'm pretty sure Mia love your name and weathering with you. The whole fucking universe love those films. But you know what? I never watch neither of them, and I will never watch them just because all of you watch it. <laughs> I don't like it when people overhype shit. I like I like to watch movies that's like nobody watch. <laughs> yes, I'm a hipster, fucking hipster. I I will readily admit it. I'm a hipster. I don't like it. I don't like the more people hype about that film, the more I will not watch it. But you see, the thing is, you guys know your name. You guys know weathering with you. But do you guys know five centimeters per second? Because I watched that before Makoto Shinkai was the Makoto Shinkai right now. <laughs> All right, have you guys watched five centimeters per second? I know I I I don't watch Makoto Shinkai films except for five centimeters per second, because as soon as Makoto Shinkai became became like the <laughs> mainstream, I would say, as soon as he entered mainstream, I stopped watching Makoto Shinkai films. <laughs> that that always happened. That always happened. I don't see him as a sellout. No, I don't. Uh, I'm happy for his career. Hello, Arun Food. I see ya. Good morning. But yes, if you have the time, watch five centimeters per per second. It's 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 not a bad film. Uh, maybe you guys will fucking love it. Okay, right? Okay. But I personally think that it's only okay. Yeah, I think I but I have very high standards of films. Uh, since there are six viewers right now, have you guys watched Everything Everywhere all the time? The one with Michelle Yeoh in it, the one about the multiverse that just came out recently. <laughs> Mia. <laughs> Hey, that's how that's how you sh ha that's how it should be, you know. It's it's uh it's all at once, okay. everything everywhere all at once, everything everywhere all at once. It's a mouthful of a title, but I fucking love it. The one with the googly eye. You'll never look at bagel the same way ever again in your life after you watch that film. Anyway. It's time to read. I'm way past my reading time. Um, <laughs> and December, like this chapter is going to be quite long, I think. I, I kind of like flip it through. Okay, give me t uh, a minute. I'm, not, I'm going to take a sip of tea, stretch a little bit, and then I'm going to start reading. People are leaving already. Fuck my life. <coughs> Hang on. I'll be right back. Check out Everything Everywhere All at Once by uh, the one by the Daniels, the directors and screenwriters and starring Michelle Yeoh and 
bunch of other really good actors. And if you are a fan of Makoto Shinkai, check out 5 centimeters per second. I believe it's made in 2006 or 2007, something like that. Alright, uh, we are back in a second. T and I shall start reading. Today we are reading Lonely Castle in the Mirror by Mizuki Tsujimura. Second semester, things fall into place, December. The city twinkled with Christmas lights. She could feel it, even from inside her house. Kokoro's family wasn't the type to put up Christmas decorations, though the neighbors always festooned their house from top to bottom. She didn't have to go outside to see them. She could pick up the flashing of their lights reflecting on the walls and the windows of her house. Don't you think we should do something for Christmas? Rion asked. It was December, and they were gathered in the castle. And on the sofa, Fuga raised her head from the book, from her book, and Masamune glanced up from his video game. They all looked at Rion. I mean, we've got this place all to ourselves, so shouldn't we get a cake or something to celebrate? Do they have Christmas in Hawaii too? Asked Fuga. Christmas was all about chubby old Santa Claus in his red outfit flying across the snowy sky. It was hard to picture this character on a tropical island. Rion laughed. <laughs> yes, of course. Though they don't have the image of white Christmas like in Japan. There's tons of posters of pictures of Santa surfing and stuff. Surfing? Kokoro didn't mean to raise her voice, but Rion chuckled even more. <laughs> the holiday is so big in America, much more than Japan. It's more like very Christmas than merry Christmas over there. You can't get away from it. I see. So, why don't we do something on Christmas Eve? We don't need to give presents, just bring some sweets and things. I'll bring a cake, and um, let's invite the Wolf Queen, he added. It's December already. The castle will close at the end of March, so shouldn't we do something fun before it's all over? The wishing key still had not turned up. Or at least, no one seemed to have found it. And they still weren't sure if after March they would even have the memory of each other at all. I like it. When Aki voiced her accent, there was a set scattering of nods. But, okay, but, Masamune began. When shall we do it? The 24th? Are you free on, the on Christmas Eve? Don't you have other plans? Works for me, Rion said. Because of the time difference, it won't overlap with a dorm party for students staying over the holidays. Christmas Eve suits? Fuka said in her bright voice. 
But I can't make it on the twenty third. I have a piano recital. Oh, Kokoro thought when she heard this. Do you play the piano? She asked.、Mm. Fuka said, "I don't go to school, but I still have private piano lessons." On Kokoro's first day at the castle, she heard the sound of a piano. It must have been Fuka. So there was a piano in her room. Kokoro had taken piano lessons up till elementary school, but had given up. She envied Fuka having something going on outside of school. I heard pi- a piano being played in one of the rooms before. Kokoro said, and Fuka gave a little gasp of, su- of surprise. Was it too loud? She asked, and Kokoro shook her head. Really, I'm relieved. Fuka said, "Isn't there a piano in your room, Kokoro? Am I the only one?" As you are a pianist, perhaps the Wolf Queen put it there especially for you. What do you have in your room, Kokoro? Fuka asked. Bookshelves, but there are hardly any books I can read. They are all in foreign languages: English, Danish, and others. Danish? Wow! How do you know it's Danish? Hans Christian Andersen is a Danish author, and there are a lot of his books. She remembered Tojo-san showing her Kokoro's room in the castle had many of the same books. That's so cool! So your room is filled with books. I had no idea. I wonder what the other rooms are like. Kokoro thought. If there was a piano for Fuka, then there must be something in each room to suit them. Okay, the twenty third is out. So what about the twenty fourth? That doesn't work for me. Aki said. I might have a date with my boyfriend. No one seems to know what to say. Aki appeared ready to elaborate, but Ryon simply said, "Sure, got it." So they settled on having the Christmas party on the twenty-fifth itself. Now that they knew they were all from the same school, the atmosphere in the castle shifted a little. Not that there was anything specific, but Kokoro sensed they had grown more relaxed around each other. For instance, when Kokoro told. When Masamune told Kokoro and the others that the free school teacher came to visit me too, they look at Masamune bewildered. Weren't you two talking about it? The classroom for the heart. He expanded, and an affirmative, ah, arose from Ureshino and Kokoro. You mean Miss Kitajima? Think so. It's a woman teacher. Ah, sorry. So you have met her too, Masamune. Masamune seemed, for some reason, a bit self-conscious. Kokoro wondered why, but then it hit her. He was feeling anxious because he has never discussed things outside the castle. So, did you visit the classroom for the heart? Kokoro asked, still a little uneasy. Easy that the name of the school was the same as hers, but she knew that this group, unlike the kids at her school, would never tease her about it. And sure enough, Masamune shook his head without dwelling on the coincidence over names. No, I have not, he said. My parents seem to know about it, but they say it's for getting kids to go back to school. They weren't thinking of sending me there. So. Your parents still think if you don't want to go to school, you don't have to. This was so different from her parents. Masamune only shrugged. I mean, my parents knew all about the hideous things that go on in schools these days. There's news all the time, isn't there, about bullying and all kind of underhand things and how kids commit suicide. My dad said, "There's no way we're gonna make him go if it means school will kill him." Masamune imitated his father's voice. "School will kill him" was a gruesome way to put it, but she was astounded to hear that there were parents like his. The thing is, Masamune continued, his eyes glazing over. They are. Really into looking for a school where I can feel safe. My dad said that the free schools are nothing more than private NPOs, but 
Then Miss Kitajima came to our house and said that she would like to talk. Masamune drew in a small breath. My mom stood at the front door and argued with her. Why are you here? We didn't ask you to come. Did his junior high school say anything? Say something? Miss Kitajima said no. The school didn't ask her to come. She just happened to hear about me from one of my friends and thought she would come over for a chat. Kokoro had never met her, but she could picture Masamune's mother scowling. Did his junior high say something? Masamune's parents must have have an intense distrust of public schools. She remembered Masamune had said months ago that teachers are were just humans after all, and that most of the time they are not even as smart as we were. Masamune must have sensed what Kokoro was thinking because he said in a small voice, When I first stopped going to school, my parents got into a heated deba- debate with my homeroom teacher. They say public school teachers aren't any good. I see. But I realized that the free school teacher you two were talking about was about the same one, so I agreed to meet her the other day. Kokoro and Ureshino exchanged a glance. Kokoro felt something warm inside. Masamune's decision to meet Kitajima was down to them. Maybe it was an exaggeration, but Kokoro was thrilled he trusted her. Masamune still looked uncharacteristically shy about discussing outside things. His nervousness made him speed up his words. We didn't really talk about anything much, but she said she would come again. She's a good person. Kokoro said. Yeah, Masamune agreed. I could kind of pick up on that. Hmm. I wonder if she's going to come over to my house soon, Aki murmured. She had been listening quietly beside them. I'm sure, I was sure there was no free school near us, but we're talking about the same junior high, aren't we? Maybe she will. If Miss Kitajima did visit Aki, Kokoro hoped she had agreed to meet her. Like Masamune had. They had worked out that they lived near each other, but that didn't mean they ever considered meeting up away from the castle. Picturing Miss Kitajima's face, Kokoro discovered a fresh joy in realizing that they had real connections in the outside world. It seemed now that even Masamune, for all his sarcasm, and Aki, who absolutely refused to talk about school, were less resistant to discussing their real lives. Though she never turned out wearing her school uniform again, Aki seemed to visit the castle more often. And as a group, all seven seemed to hang out together in the castle more than ever before. Kokoro had never imagined herself celebrating Christmas with a party of her own peers again. She was overjoyed. Last year, she and her friends had met up at her classmate Satsuki's house. She wondered how Satsuki was. A bolt of pain shot through her. They had been in, dif- in different classes at Yukishina No. 5 Junior High. She remembered how Satsuki said that she would join the softball team. It was tough going, the practice was grueling, but she was doing her best, and Kokoro could picture her giving it her all. They had been friends for such a long time, living parallel lives. But now, Ko- Satsuki must view Kokoro as one of the special students who di- didn't go to school. Kokoro was used to it now, but it still hurt to have these thoughts. The second semester was almost over. Winter break was around the corner. The year was nearly over. In the midst of all this, as Christmas drew near, Kokoro's mother came up to her bedroom one evening and asked, Can I talk to you? Her voice was tense, and Kokoro was filled with dread. Something was waiting to bring an egg to her chest and a heaviness to the pit of her stomach. A part of her wanted to know what was coming, another part, not so much. Her mother said, Mr. Ida mentioned he wanted to drop by tomorrow during the day, is that okay? Her mother had probably stayed in touch with him, just like she had done with Miss Kitajima. But there's a fundamental difference between Miss Kitajima and Mr. Ida. 
Whenever Mr. Ida dropped by, Kokoro became incredibly anxious. She would begin to sweat, feeling as if she were about to suffocate. He's coming by now because the second semester's finished, she suddenly thought. At this point, he had to take note of anyone not attending. That was his job after all. Her mother's voice was still strained, or at least it seemed that way. He said he has something he wants to tell you about another girl from your class. Kokoro wasn't at all sure that he, she could maintain her composure. The words pierced straight to her heart. A girl? In my class? A girl called Sanada. Who is the class president? A siren began to wail somewhere deep inside her ears. Then it faded. Her mother looked at her, suddenly stern, and Kokoro found it hard to breathe. So something did happen? What was it? What did he say? He said he thinks you and that girl had an argument. A chill shot up her spine. An argument. She made it sound so innocuous. Anger started to boil up inside her so intense that she thought she was going to pass out. In an argument, two people can communicate their point to each other. They are on an equal footing. What had happened to Kokoro was by no means an argument. Kokoro stood, lips pursed, and silent. Her mother sent something. Let's meet him, she said. Let's meet him, you and I. Did something happen? Her mother asked again. Kokoro bit her lip. And after a pause, said, They came to our house. She had finally come up with it. Her mother's eyes widened. Kokoro raised her head slowly. I... You should never say you hate anyone. Her mother had always said this. That no matter how disgusted you might be with a friend, you should never speak ill of them. Kokoro thought she would annoy her mother if she had said anything. Mom, I... I hate Sanada Sang. Her mother's eyes narrowed. And we never argued. Mr. Ida dropped by the next morning. Good morning, Bit. Hey, we are in the midst of the chapter December. December. Hell yeah. Oh, thank you. I should stretch. <sighs> All right. Mr. Ida dropped by the next morning. It was a Tuesday and school was still in progress, but he apparently arrived between lessons. Kokoro's mother had taken the day off work. His hair was a little longer than the last time she had seen him. He took off his well-worn sneakers at the door and turned to Kokoro. Good morning, Kokoro. How are you? From the beginning, Mr. Ida had caught so had called her simply Kokoro, with none of the usual suffixes. She had only spent a month in his class, yet he used the same casual form of address as he did with anyone he liked. Sorry. And it certainly had made her happy to be spoken this way, since it made her feel ordinary just like the others. But after this initial happy feeling, she got the sense that Mr. Ida had intentionally used the form of address in order to make her feel relaxed. It was his job. Showing concern was part of it. She knew it was immature and stupid to worry about something so petty, but she could not help it. 
He was anyway at the beck and call of Miyori Sanada and her little gang. Even if she tried, Kokoro couldn't forget a scene in the classroom back in April. Mr. Ida, do you have a girlfriend? One of the girls had asked him. Even if I did, I wouldn't tell you, he said. But I want to know what a liar you are, Ida-san, she said, contracting the word sensei. Wait, that's not the way to speak to me, you know, he was laughing. You guys, he said. He wasn't really angry with them. He was completely Ida-sen to Miyori and her little gang. And this were Kokoro's thoughts whenever he had said to her, Don't push yourself too hard. Don't push yourself too hard, but everyone will be glad if you come back to school. He may have said it with kind intentions, but it seemed to her he didn't really care one way or the other. Why didn't you like going to school? Did something happen? When he had first asked her and she hadn't responded. Sorry? She got the sense he had labeled her a slacker and his impression hadn't changed. But she didn't mind. What do you expect? Teachers were invariably on the side of students like Miyori Sanada, who stood out, the ones who spoke confidently in class, who played with their friends at break, the lively, straightforward ones. She desperately wanted to tell him what they had done and see him look dumbstruck, but she was pretty sure even after she, he had heard the whole story, he would still take their side. In fact, she knew knew it. She knew she would go straight to Miyori to ask if it was all true and she would never admit it. She would only mention whatever made her look good. When Miyori and her friends had surrounded Kokoro's house and Kokoro had lain on the floor trembling, Miyori started to cry and her friends had tried to comfort her saying, don't cry Miyori. In that world, Kokoro was the villain unbelievable but true the three of them sat in the living room mr ida kokoro and her mother compared to his earlier visits her mother was clearly anxious the previous night kokoro had told her mother the story of what happened with miyori back in april she had never talked about it all these months but she wanted her mother to hear it directly from her especially as mr ida would have explained it as a some kind of argument when Mr. Ida arrived, Kokoro was told to wait upstairs in her bedroom. Your teacher and I will talk first, just the two of us, her mother said. Her mother's expression was so cold and angry. She did as she was told. Enough time had passed since the events of April that when Kokoro had told her mother the full story of what had happened, she could do it without breaking down in tears. She thought it would be actually be fine to cry to show her mother how much she had suffered but somehow no tears would come it was tough enough for her to explain it was all as petty as boyfriend girlfriend stuff who like who but she managed she wanted her mother to get emotional and upset for her to say what awful people and protect her daughter mom will be so angry was her first thought but in the end she wasn't as she told the story, her mother's eyes well up. When Kokoro saw the tears, she was shaken and even less able to cry herself. I'm so sorry, Kokoro, her mother said. I never realized any of this was going on. I'm so, so sorry. She hugged Kokoro close and clapped her fingers. Her mother's tears plopped down on the back of Kokoro's hand. We'll fight this, her mother said her voice trembling. It will be a long battle, but let's fight it. Let's do it, Kokoro. Back in her bedroom, she saw the mirrors glowing again. Today, everyone would be getting together beyond the mirror, and she badly wanted to be with them. 
but instead she quietly left her bedroom, walked down the bottom of the stairs, and pricked up her ears. It was a small house, so even though the door to the living room was closed, she could still just make out what they were saying. There seems to be some trouble amongst the girls. She heard the she heard her teacher say, "It's not argument; it's how Kokoro put it." Her mother said. Kokoro felt a stab of pain in her heart. The voices grew louder and then quieter, like waves ebbing and flowing. Wasn't Miss Kitajima supposed to come with you today? She heard her mother say. Uh, no, Mr. Ida said. I came alone, since this is an issue in our school. Kokoro remembered Miss Kitajima and the tea bag she had brought her. We can use those tea bags at our castle Christmas party, she thought, and everyone can taste them. Miss Kitajima might have told Mr. Ida something, wanting to cooperate with the school. She might have looked into what had happened in April. You are battling every single day, aren't you? Remembering her voice, Kokoro longed to see her again. She gently closed her eyes, then she heard her teacher's voice. It sounded as if he were making excuses. Y- you see, Sonoda has her own... Uh, she's a cheerful, very responsible student. What did you say? Her mother's voice grew sharper and emotional for the first time. Kokoro wanted to pluck her ears. She slipped back upstairs to her bedroom. The mirror was shining. The rainbow light that opened the entrance to the castle was so gentle. She touched the glowing surface softly with her fingers. Help, she thought. Help me. Someone, help me. A while passed before she was called downstairs. The faces of both her mother and Mr. Ida had reddened since earlier when Kokoro joined them. They tensed up even more. The atmosphere was so heavy it was as if the very color of the air had changed. Kokoro, her teacher said, would you be willing to meet Sanada to talk through what happened? When she heard his words, she felt she couldn't breathe. Her heart began to pound in his gate, in its cage. She stared mutely at her teacher. She's uh, the kind of girl that people often misunderstand, and I'm sure there were things that hurt you, Kokoro, but I talked to Sanada, and she's concerned about you. She regrets it. I totally doubt that, a voice said. It was Kokoro's heightened voice, trembling. Mr. Ida stared at her in astonishment. Kokoro shook her head. If she regrets anything, is that you might have been annoyed with her. There's no way she is worried about me. She's just afraid no one will like what she has done. Kokoro got this all out in a rush. She never imagined she would say so much. She could tell how it unsettled Mr. Ida. Kokoro, the thing is, he began... Mr. Ida, her mother stepped in between them. He held his eyes, her voice calm. Shouldn't we first hear directly from Kokoro what happened, just as you have heard from Miss Sanada, Sanada's account? Mr. Ida looked silently. He was about to say something, but her mother spoke first. That's enough for today, she said. Next time. I would like you to bring that teacher in charge of the whole year, or even the head with you. Mr. Ida said nothing, his lips drawn tight. He looked down, avoiding her mother's eyes and Kokoro's. I'll come again soon, he said, and got to his feet. After she had seen him off the front door, her mother called her. Kokoro? She was about to ask her something, but stopped. Changed her mind, she looked tired, but calmer, more collected. How about coming shopping with me? Her mother asked. We don't have to go to the mall. If there's something or somewhere else you would prefer to go, let's go. It's a weekday. Around midday. So she could get away with not seeing any other junior high school students. She was seated in front of the food court at Kareo with her mother eating an ice cream. 
inside Kareo there were the McDonald's, Mr. Donut, and even Mitsudo, Misudo that Kokoro liked, but she avoided them since students from school were often there. It had been so long she, since she had been outside her house, since the day she had bought the chocolates for Fuka at the convenience store. The light outside seemed dazzling, and she was consumed with awkwardness around anyone other than her family or the castle group, but her mother was with her today, so she felt less frightened. As these thoughts ran through her head, she realized she was searching for someone. Whenever she saw a young person with dyed hair pass by, she would look carefully hoping it was Aki or Subaru. Would Ureshino or Fuka turn up on the walkway over there, arm in arm with their parents like her? Would Masamune pass right in front of her, carrying a bag with the latest video games that he had just bought? She hoped it could it would come true. She even hoped that Rion, far away in Hawaii, might suddenly make an appearance. How awesome if it would be if one of them spotted her and she could introduce them to her mother as my friend. But no one appeared. It was a weekday. The food court was almost deserted. And the others must be in the castle. In the days when you were younger, Kokoro, her mother, sitting opposite, was likewise scanning the passerby. The mall wasn't as colorfully decorated as it is right now. These days, the stores were decked out with vibrant red, green, and white decorations, and jingle bells rang out relentlessly from speakers above them. Her mother carried on voicing her thoughts. Do you remember when you were little and we went to eat in a restaurant at Christmas? A French restaurant? You just started elementary school. Maybe it was a little before. Sort of. She definitely remembered going with her parents to a fancy restaurant that was quite unlike the places they usually went to. And she remembered the lively end of the year atmosphere in the shops. She remembered how they were brought, they brought out so many varied dishes, each on a separate plate, different from the usual rice omelette lunch she was used to ordinary family restaurants. And she recalled thinking, even as a child, how this was all this was the real thing when it comes to food. I remember how they brought out one little dish after another for you and that, and I thought it was odd. You finished one and they brought out another. I was wondering if we, it would ever end. That's because we rarely eat a set meal like that, her mother said. I remember too, you asked, can't we go home now? How many more are you going to eat? Her mother laughed. Let's go somewhere to this year. The restaurant is closed now, but your dad and I can look for another one. Kokoro thought maybe she knew why her mother seemed to be avoiding the subject of Mr. Ida or Miyori. She hadn't felt like discussing anything either, not so soon. But there was one thing she did want to say. She turned to her mother, whose gaze was far away. Mom? Hmm? Thank you. Her mother looked intently at Kokoro, but her face was expressionless. Kokoro had needed to get that out. Thank you for saying that to Mr. Ida, for telling him what I said. Truthfully, she was worried whether her story had been properly conveyed. Her teacher must have really must really have a negative impression of Kokoro now. He had suggested to meet that she meet with Miyori Sanada, but she had refused, and now he must certainly view her as a problem child with none of the honesty or integrity he expected to see in his pupils. You believe me, mom? Of course I did! Her mother's voice sounded a bit husky, and she looked down at her hands. Of course I did! She repeated, her voice now clearly trembling. She dabbed her eyes with her fingers, and when she looked, at, she looked up, Kokoro saw they were red. You must have been so frightened, her mother said. When I heard the story, I was frightened too. 
Kokoro blinked in surprise. And I just really wish you had told me sooner. When I was talking to your teacher, I felt I could understand how you must be feeling. Her mother lifted the corners of her mouth into a tired, listless smile. When I told him it wasn't your fault, I was convinced of it, but I was still worried whether he would believe me or not. I wasn't sure if I had properly explained how frightened you really were, and that maybe he had not understood, but it took courage to say that. Her mother reached across the table and took Kokoro's small hands in hers. Do you want to change schools? She asked. Change schools? At first, the meaning didn't hit her. She felt her mother's cool palm holding hers, and then it came to her. She was actually talking about transferring to a different school. Kokoro's eyes widened. The idea had occurred to her before. Sometimes it seemed like a great idea. At other moments, it seems like a backward way of thinking, as if she was running away. There were students from elementary school day that she really liked. It frustrated her to think the likes of Miyori would force her to leave. Miyori and her gang would never regret what they did, and the anger and embarrassment made her sick to her stomach, picturing them laughing over how they were the ones who had got rid of her. Until now, though, it hadn't seemed a realistic option. Even if she wanted to transfer, she hadn't thought her mother would allow it. But now, her mother explained it. If you want to transfer to a different school, Kokoro, I'll look into it. It might mean going further away, but that let's research it together. Whether there are junior highs in the next school district or private junior highs that you could attend. But Kokoro was still anxious that even in a new school, she might still fail to manage. Transfer students stood out, and her new classmates might soon discover that she had run away from her old school. Still, the possibility remained that she might actually fit in to the new school as if nothing had ever happened. It was certainly a sweet-sounding prospect. More than anything, her mother seemed to be on board with the idea, which gave her a warm, soft feeling inside. Her mother recognized her daughter's wasn't going to be hopeless forever. Jingle bells continued to peel out from the sound system, interrupted by a cheerful announcement of Christmas sales. Can I think about it? Kokoro asked, thinking of her friends in the castle. Going to a new school was a tempting idea, but it did mean losing her status as a student at Yukishina No. 5 Junior High. She may well lose the right to visit the castle and not be able to see anyone there ever again. She could not bear the thought. Of course, her mother said. Let, we'll think about it together. Afterwards, Kokoro went food shopping with her mother. She spotted a box of assorted chocolate. Can we get this? she asked. She wanted to take it to the Christmas party. She was thinking her mother might find it suspicious, for she surely couldn't eat them all herself, but she readily agreed and dropped it into the shopping basket. They were on their way to the car park when Kokoro stopped, suddenly gazed to the array of shops that lined in the mall. Is something wrong? her mother asked. It's just been such a long time since I've been outside. The gleam of light still made her dizzy, but she found herself getting used to them. Mom, thank you for bringing me. For a moment, her mother looked at her as if struck by some unseen shock. She took Kokoro's hand and pulled it closer to her. I'm so happy we could come together. They hadn't walked like this, fingers interlocked since the lower years in elementary school. Hand in hand, they returned. To their car. A moment for tea.
at the castle Christmas party, Rion arrived with a cake. The group gave a wow when they saw it. It looks delicious, Kokoro chimed in. It was a chiffon cake with a hole in the middle. The icing was uneven. It didn't look as though it had been bought in a shop. The fruit decorations on top were a little irregular too, but that gave the cake its charm. Is it homemade? Masamune asked. By a girlfriend? Aki asked, and Kokoro's heart beat fast for an instant. All eyes were on Rion. Boys who played football were always popular with the girls. Maybe that's why he was studying abroad. They hadn't talked about it, but it certainly would make sense if he had a girlfriend. But Rion shook his head. Nope, it's my mom's, he said. She bakes one every year. She came over for Christmas, stayed in my dorm and gave it to me, so I brought it. She can stay in your dorm? Yeah, they can stay for a few days. They have rooms and with kitchens for them. Kokoro glanced at the clock on the wall, vaguely considered the time difference. It was midday in Japan, so in Hawaii, it would be the late afternoon of the previous day. It was Christmas Day in Japan, but for Rion, it probably still felt like Christmas Eve. Kokoro had the impression that it was more usual for people from other countries to spend Christmas as a family than in Japan. Kokoro's family was the same. They had gone out for a meal the night before. But today, Christmas Day, her parents had unusually gone out together, which allowed her to come here. Leon, she asked, are you coming back to Japan for the break? It wasn't as if she was asking to meet him outside the castle, but his living so far away in Hawaii made it impossible for them to ever meet outside. And just the idea that he might come back to Japan and be somewhere nearby made her happy. But Rion shook his head. No, I'm not coming back, he said. My mom was only in Hawaii for two days. Then she said she had to go home. She said she was busy. Oh, I see. Mm, let's eat, Rion said. He had brought the cake knife to cut it into slices. As he unpacked it, Kokoro considered something. Rion's mother had brought the cake, but had not stayed to actually eat it with her son. Maybe she thought he would share it with his friends, but it was Christmas and the other kids in the dorm would have gone back home to their families. That must have been what Rion meant when he said so empathetically, I'm not going back. Kokoro remember what that it was Rion who had come up with the suggestion to have a Christmas party in the castle saying that he would bring a cake. What was he feeling when he made that suggestion? He recalled his voice, the words Rion had spoken to the Wolf Queen. My school isn't Yukishina number five and yet here I am. Why did you summon someone like me? And the Wolf Queen's response, But you badly wanted to go, didn't you? To the public high school in your area? What did that mean? Going to school in Hawaii, just the sum of it made them single him out as wealthy. It's not that great, he, he has told them. Hey, Let's invite the Wolf Queen too. Wolf Queen! He called, slicing into the cake. He put the knife down. I can't cut even slices. All oh, the girls have to, to have a go. Ureshino said, Kokoro should do it. She peeled an apple for me once. She'll be good at it. Eh? I have no idea if I could do it properly. Kokoro smiled wryly as she remembered what trouble peeling an apple had led to. She was happy to be asked to be in charge of the cake. You called? A light voice spoke and the wolf queen materialized. We have a cake, Rion said. But can you even eat it with that mask on? Do you ever actually eat? The wolf queen moved her head slowly to the side and studied the homemade chiffon cake. Rippled with icing on the top. The tableau was surreal. But the combination of her dream-like dress and mask and the sugary cake seemed to work together somehow, she finally answered. 
I won't eat it here. She lifted her head slowly at Rion. If you cut me a slice, I'll take it with me. The group looked on with bemused smiles. They had never imagined the wolf queen whom they had taken to be a completely fantastical art character would show such an appetite like some little girl. But all Rion said was, okay, and this is for you too. He reached out around to take a small package out from his backpack and handed it to her. We had this at home, but if you don't mind, I'd like to have I would like you to have it too. They talk about not exchanging presents, but he apparently brought something anyway. The wolf queen stared for a long time at the package in his hands before finally accepting it. Okay, she, she said, placing it behind her back. Kokoro had expected the wolf queen to unwrap it immediately, but Rion made no comment. So, let's have some cake, he said. Despite the decision not to bring gifts to the Christmas party, Aki too had brought something. Pretty patterned paper napkins like the one she brought before. She handed one out to each of them. These were part of the same series as those she had given Fuka on her birthday, though in a different pattern. Jeez, I should have brought something too, Urashino said loudly. What surprised Kokoro was the moment when Masamune laid out a pile of manga products for the boys and told them they were presents. Take as many of them as you want, he said. Kokoro was stunned. A lot of them were freebies found in the back of manga, but there were some gift tokens for the books too. Wow! Tokens for the One Piece series! Kokoro loved manga too. She turned the gift token over and noticed there was a maximum of 500 yen on it. Masamune always brought in a lot of video games and seemed to own so many things, but he didn't seem to consider money and possessions as particularly important. These are all mangas for boys, so I don't know what they are, and I don't need any, Aki said making a face. But Subaru said, hey, are these new? In that case, I'll take one. He reached out for one of the gift tokens. Which one do you prefer? Uh, Aki asked him. If you are not bothered about them, Masamune was irritated. Then don't get involved. It's such a surprise, Aki shot back. Whether I'm interested or not is beside the point. I'm just so astonished that you did even think of bringing us presents, Masamune. You are so annoying. If you're going to diss them, then give them back. It took time to get all this stuff together, you know. No, I'll have one actually. Kokoro moved in to thank him. No problem, Masamune said, looking away and blowing out his cheek. Rion's mother's cake was deliciously spongy, rich with veg and light as air. Rion was thrilled with the assorted chocolate Kokoro had brought. I haven't seen this in a long time, he said. I used to eat them a lot when I was back in Japan. Kokoro had made tea from the tea bags Miss Kitajima had given her. She poured out a cup for each of them from her thermos. Aki and Fuka ooh and ah at the strawberry tea flavor and its, de- and its delicious aroma. It's so good, they said, which made her glad. I would like to have it again one day, Fuka added. When Kokoro told her that she got the tea from Miss Kitajima, Fuka said, Perhaps I should go there too, to that free school you went to, Kokoro. I would like to meet Miss Kitajima, Fuka said, and Fuka had at some point. Also dropped the chang from when she addressed Kokoro. Okay, said Kokoro. I'm sure she would love to meet you. Actually, I would like your advice on something. Well, thank you. I'll see you again, Arun. Actually, I would like your advice on something. Masamune had begun a serious conversation around 4 o'clock, an hour before the castle was due to close. He was speaking to all while they were relaxed, chatting. The wolf queen had departed at some point, taking her slice of cake and the unopened present from Leon. Advice on something, 
That sounded a touch formal from Masamune. What? said Aki. Masamune stood up in the center of the group. The rest were sitting on the floor or lying down, hands behind their heads. He held his right elbow tightly with the other hand. Kokoro noticed how hard he was gripping it. Masamune didn't usually do tension. Advice? They seemed doubtful. I was wondering if you all... J just one day, if you could... During the third semester... School... Masamune went on. His voice sounded painfully husky and he was avoiding their eyes. He broke off and looked up at them. Could you come to school just for one day? One day would be enough. A chorus of gaps. Masamune gripped his elbow harder. My parents told me to think about it. Going to a different school. Starting the third semester. A pain shot through Kokoro. She remembered her mother in the food court at Kareo. Asking her, do you want to change schools? It was because the second semester had finished, Kokoro thought. Kokoro's situation was a bit different. But this might be might not be the first I but this might not be the first time the idea had been discussed in Maslamune's house, as his parents had been criticizing the public school teachers for quite a while. I've always dodged the idea, but now things are getting real. My dad said that during the winter break, he was going to put my name down for a private junior high. So, you would start in a different school for the third semester? Fuka asked. Masamune nodded. But maybe that's a good idea, don't you think? Ureshino sound said, sounding solemn. I've been thinking about it too, that it'll be easier just to move somewhere else and start again in a new class. I was thinking about it too. But you know, if you're going to change schools, wouldn't it be better to do it later, when the new school year starts? I would never consider moving so soon. In the third semester of this school year, Masamune usually had quite a condescending manner, and Kokoro couldn't believe how mild and feeble he had become. She knew he was describing real feelings, that he had been driven to the point where he had to leave. Kokoro knew how he felt, but being a transfer student at a new school in the middle of the academic year, that was a different story altogether. And also, I hate the thought Masamune seemed to be making himself angry. If I start at a different school, then it's likely I won't be able to to come here anymore. The others chewed their lips in silence. They knew exactly what he was trying to say. They had only been able to keep visiting the castle till the end of March, but if they were to lose even that precious diminishing time. So I told my father I didn't want to switch to a private school yet. I said instead I would try going back to Yukishina number five's junior high. Masamune had started to speak more quickly as if trying to justify himself. Hey, Sam! Yeah, we are reading Lonely Castle in the Mirror about Mizuki Tsujimura. We are in the second chapter in the month of December right now. Uh, we are basically halfway through the book. We still have half of more of the book to go through. I think it might take a few more days, probably. But I've been busy lately, so that's why I've, like, it's been taking so long to finish this book. <clears throat> a quick moment for tea. I would go on the first day only. That would be enough. I'll tell them I gave it a try, but couldn't take it. 
that would delay them sending me to a new school until April when the new school year starts. And you want all of us to go into school then because? Aki asked. Masamune's face tense up, eyes darting between them. I was just hoping that all of you could come to school on the same day as me. Masamune hung his head. This wasn't like him at all. You don't actually need to go to your classroom. You could just go to the nurse's office or the library. They'll think that it's a progress that you have even made it in. There's even an expression going straight to the nurse's office, isn't there? Subaru said, and Masamune looked up. I've been wondering this for a while, Masamune said. Why were we all summoned here from the same school, Yukishina Number 5 Junior High? I was thinking there must be some reason. I don't know if the Wolf Queen intended it that way, but I was thinking we could all help each other. All help each other? Masamune's eyes look super serious, on the verge of tears. Kokoro gazed at his expression and felt the weight of his words, and she remembered how at the food court with her mother, she scanned the walkway, hoping to catch a glimpse of one of them. How she was, she was waiting for someone around the corner, and she would be able to wave to them. How she was fantasizing about it, how great that would be. So... It wasn't advice you wanted, but our help, Subaru said. He gave an exaggerated shrug and waved the voucher card Masamune had given him. Is this Christmas present a bribe then? To convince all of us to help you? Masamune looked at Subaru stiffly. I know I have a lot of nerve asking this, he said curtly, but okay, I'll go. Subaru said, I'll be waiting in the classroom on the appointed day. Masamune's eyes widened hopefully. I'm in classroom 3 in 3rd year. If you go to your classroom, you feel you can't, you, you can't take it, you can come to mine. I haven't been at school for a while, but I might score some points if a younger student starts to suck up to me. I might not be able to stand going back into a classroom, Aki said. Her tone was sharp as usual, though it didn't sound like she was angry. Though if it's only to the nurse's office, I think it will be fine if you hide out there. The teacher should allow it. Me too, Kokoro burst out. Mom and Dad will be so happy if I tell them I'm going to school, she thought. They'll warn me not to overdo it, but I know they'll be relieved with Sanada san with Sanada-san around, I'll skip the classroom and go straight to the nurse's office. Actually, my parents might feel better if I do that. Above all, she thought of meeting the others outside the castle and made her jump with joy. She knew how Masamune was feeling. I feel so sorry for those loners, Sanada-san had said that about her. The words still smoldered inside her. She wanted to them She wanted to show them that she was no loner. She too had friends and in other years these kids are all my friends and Masamune must have felt the same way. I might not have friends in my class, Kokoro thought, but because all of us are supporting each other, I can go into school. Well then I'll go into the nurse's office too. Fuka said as if completing Kokoro's thought. When is the opening ceremony school? What day should we go? January the 10th, Masamune said quickly, as if half afraid of date and, and half anticipating it. His eyes look even more tearful. Gotcha, Fuka said. During the holiday break, I'm going to Juku again from my grandma's house, so I won't be at the castle for a while, but I am on board. The 10th, I'll be there, I promise. Can I... think about it? Urashino's beady eyes flitted around, and then he quickly added, I'm not saying I don't like the idea of being there for each other, that's not it. 
it's because at the beginning of the second semester, the day of the opening ceremony, I went into school and had that terrible experience. Kokoro thought of the day Ureshino had turned up covered in bandages, so my mom might not let me. Sorry, he muttered and looked over at Masamune. If I'm allowed to go, though, I will. Is that okay? Yeah, Masamune nodded. He gazed down as if unsure where to look. Thank you, guys, he said. His voice cut out at the end. He bowed his head one more time, just slightly. Thank you. I mean it. I envy you people. I can't join you. Rion's eyes reflected his words. He looked a little sad. I'm envious you're going to meet up outside the castle. Kokoro's heart leapt as if taking wings at those words. Her chest still felt shackled by the fear, but her heart beat fast at the thought of seeing all of them waiting together in the nurse's office dressed in their school uniforms. It will be fine, she thought. We are going to support each other. We'll fight together. And that is the end of the second semester. We have about 40 minutes to go. I think probably I can do one more chapter or month. January. I don't think it's that long. It should be fine. <sighs> Let me check on her. Yep, I can do January. <clears throat> One second for tea. Chapter 3 Third Semester Goodbye January Kokoro 7th grade Classroom 4 Ureshino 7th grade Classroom 1 Fuka 8th grade Classroom 3 Masamune 8th grade Classroom 6 Subaru Ninth grade, classroom three. Aki, ninth grade, classroom five. They exchange essential information about their classrooms, except for Rion, who, of course, lives abroad. They promise if anything happened, they would escape to the nurse's office. If the nurse's office didn't work out, then they would go to the library. If the library wasn't looking good. Then, the music room. And if none of those work, they would make a run for it. Run out of the building, back home, and escape through the mirror to the castle. They work this all out in time for 10th of January. The day before they were due to meet was a holiday coming of age day when 20 year olds across the country celebrated their reaching adulthood. Kokoro's parents stayed home that day but Kokoro chose a moment when they wouldn't come up to her room and slip through the mirror into the castle. She wanted to confirm with Masamune and the others their promise to meet up at school. The others seemed to be doing the same for most of them were also there escaping their parents' watchful eyes. Just before saying their goodbyes, Kokoro caught up with Masamune. They were standing in the grand foyer, about to exit the castle through their mirrors. It was almost five o'clock. Tomorrow's the day, she said to him. One moment, please.
Tomorrow's the day, she said to him. At that moment, Wolf Queen's howl rang out like a siren, signaling the closing of the castle. They had been hit by such powerful tremors recently that they were about to exit at five o'clock that it scared them, and so they usually make sure to leave before they heard the curfew howl fifteen minutes before the hour. Yeah. Masamune murmured, ignoring the howl. He seemed self-conscious and reluctant to engage. His cheeks looked pale. Kokoro didn't know the details of what made him drop out of school. He knew his parents were pretty progressive and respected their son's decision not to go, but there had to be a reason behind it all. Just like her. Masamune, she said. There's a girl in my class I don't get on with at all. Don't get on with was a convenient expression. It can't. It helped her to avoid all the possible nuances. I hate her. I can't stand her. She bullied me. What happened to Kokoro wasn't a fight or bullying. It was neither, she thought, but something she couldn't put a name to. When adults and friends put it down to bullying, she, it made her so irritated she wanted to cry. I don't want to go to school because I know she'll be there, and if you and the others are with me, Masamune, then I'll be fine. What? Masamune said almost inaudibly, and look at Kokoro. What the hell? Are you trying to show me how heroic you are by saying that you'll go in with me even with all that crap that happened to you? Are you trying to show me how hard it would be for you? Not at all. Kokoro was relieved to hear Masamune's back to his usual cynical self. Not long ago, that term might have frustrated her, but now she knew she shouldn't take him literally. All the time they had spent together had taught her that. She knew that Masamune wasn't actually grateful to her for being willing to ignore past events and meet up with him. He would just twist it around to sound like the opposite. What I'm saying is, despite what's going on for me, she said, I feel safe knowing all of us will be together. You're not the only one who is uneasy about it. You feel you'll be safe knowing we'll be there. Well. We feel the same, knowing you'll be there. Masamune heard her out and was reaching for the mirror when his fingers clenched and grabbed hold of the frame. Yeah, he murmured. See you tomorrow, Kokoro said, emphasizing the words even more than usual. Yeah, see you tomorrow. At school. Mom, I'm going to go to school tomorrow. Kokoro's mother looked momentarily blank, as if time had stopped. But it was just only an instant. Oh, is it? Is that so? She said. Kokoro knew she was deliberately showing a lack of concern. Kokoro had bided her time, avoiding saying anything until the day before she was due to go in. The evening of the ninth, they were doing the washing up together when Kokoro gave her the news. Are you sure you are okay with that? Her mother avoided her eyes. Kokoro followed suit, keeping her gaze on her hands as she dried the plates. I'm fine with it. I would actually like, like to go. I would actually like to try going in, even for one day. She f- she planned to arrive for after lessons had started at nine thirty, and go straight into the nurse's office instead of a classroom, and straight back home if she couldn't manage it. She explained the plan to her mother. So, don't worry about me. She pleaded. Do you want me to go with you? No, I'll be fine. Kokoro said. In all honesty, though, she would have loved for her to come. Her heart was pounding. Just the image of the hallways and the front entrance was enough to make her freeze up. But the rest of the group would no doubt come in alone without a parent. Masamune's parents, so down on the state school system, would definitely not accompany him, and Subaru wasn't even living with his parents. Her mother said she would contact. Ureshino, Fuka, and Aki might bring their mothers along, but even if one of them arrived on their own, Kokoro wanted to do the same. 
Kokoro's mother said that she would contact the school, Mr. Ida, to tell them in advance that Kokoro would be in the next day. This is so sudden. Why don't you go in a little later? Like next week? But it's the opening ceremony. What? She put down a wet plate and wiped her hands on the apron. The opening ceremony was the end of last week, on the 6th of January. What? Her mother brought p- out a piece of paper which had been lying on the small rack of- for letters in the living room. A note from school that Tojo-san had delivered. Kokoro usually just handed this to her mother without looking at them. On the school events calendar, sure enough, the opening ceremony was on January the 6th. You are right. As the opening ceremony had already happened at the end of last week, lessons would begin the next day. A three-day weekend, including the coming-of-age holiday, fell in between. But the first day of class was tomorrow. Had Masamune misunderstood? She suddenly wanted to dash back into the castle to check, but that night, the mirror didn't shine. She regretted. Not exchanging phone numbers. Ah! But maybe that's right, she thought. Masamune had said he was going back to school at the start of the third semester. It was Fuka who asked, when is the opening ceremony at school? What day should we go? Kokoro had naively concluded that Masamune was going to school on the day of the opening ceremony, but he had never actually said that he would go to it with students trooping to and from the gym it would get so chaotic if they were going to meet at the nurse's office an ordinary school day would surely be preferable see you tomorrow at school the promise masamune and kokoro had made to each other thank you for worrying about me but i would still like to go she said the next morning her mother set off for work as usual Kokoro had told her she wanted her to go. Even so, her mother fussed about at the front door, checking on Kokoro several times. Though her usual time to leave came and went, she still lingered. Don't overdo it, okay? If you feel like you can't handle things, come home early, she said. I'll call you in the afternoon. Okay. Her mother finally stepped through the front door. I'll be off in a minute then, mum. Kokoro said, seeing her mother off with a wave. When she reached the gate, her mother turned around. Your bicycle, she said. Your your last night, your father cleaned the seat for you. It was quite dusty. Oh? He said he would come home early today. He said to tell you not to overdo it. Mm. Last night, he had said the same thing directly to her. He seemed quite anxious, but also a little relieved. You are an amazing kid, he told her, to decide to go back on your own. I think you are incredible. It hurt to think that she was only going in for a day, but hearing him praise her did make her happy. And maybe, maybe seeing everyone today, she wouldn't be so scared of going in the next day. She might be able to attend school properly together with all of them. She left home at nine, avoiding the window when other students usually arrive. She hadn't ridden her bike for so long, and as she climbed on, the seat felt cold under her skirt. She breathed in the chilly air. She started to pedal. A thought struck her. I'm not going into my class, she thought. I'm not going to school. I'm going to see my friends. It just happens that the place we are meeting is at school. The entrance to the school was deserted. When she reached the bicycle area, she she hesitated to leave her bike in the space reserved for her class and instead park it at the 8th grade graders area. It still hurt to remember what Miyori and her boyfriend had done to her here last spring, but today no one was around and it was another season. She could hear the sound of lessons taking place inside the school, the sound of teachers lecturing, not many students speaking though. She slipped off her shoes in front of the 
cubie holes at the entrance where students stored their outside shoes. The action was so familiar, but she located her cubie hole. An invisible force made her chest tighten. She felt a gaze from the side, and when she glanced over, her eyes widened. The other girl's eyes widened too. It was Moe Tojo, the girl who lived two doors away from her street. They were both speechless. Tojo-san was wearing a jersey and carried a school-approved satchel. She seemed to have just arrived too. She was just as pretty as ever, with a perfect nose and her round eyes, with a touch of light brown, almost European look. If there were... If there had been plenty of students around them, Kokoro could have looked away, but it was just the two of them. A physical pain ran across her shoulders, down her back, through her entire body, and she was reminded, Ah, this is how it feels. She had intended never to forget the pain, but now she realized she had actually begun to forget. Until last May. She had this sensation every single day. Her stomach heavy and aching. I don't want to go in, she shouted inside. But then Tojo-san made a move. She suddenly reached out to retrieve her slippers from her cubie hole. She put them on, averting her eyes from Kokoro without a word, started walking briskly down the corridor, heading towards the stairs that led to her classroom. Moe had left her behind, completely ignoring her. Her figure grew smaller before she disappeared upstairs. She had definitely given Kokoro a good look. Those mesmerizing doll-like eyes, which Kokoro once felt so compelled to stare at, had swiftly blanked her. So you are back, eh? She had been expecting some remark. Even if it was, it was sarcastic, just a word or two. Things around her started to spin. Her breathing grew shallow, as if she were in water, drowning. Moe had one delivered handouts every day from school. She thought, but now she can't even say a word to me? Why would she be here at the school entrance at this time in the morning? This is the only time I could bear to come in, but you, you can just march in any time you want. She had been looking forward to see Masamune and the rest, but the happy anticipation now began to wither. Someone help me! She, well, she felt weak as she leaned against the QB holes. Kokoro had been picturing her slippers and her desk covered in graffiti, the depictions of bullying on televisions. Always showed such things happening. The kid who wouldn't come to school always found her chair and desk with vicious message like DIE scrawled all over them. No matter how often she told herself that what was happened between Miyori Sanada and her wasn't bullying, she was still terrified of it happening to her. But nobody had written graffiti on her slippers or filled them with thumbtacks. Instead, she spotted a letter, an envelope, with a small bunny sticker on it. Hand trembling, she picked it up. The sender's name was on the back of the envelope. It was from Miyori Sanada. A deafening noise rang through her ears. A smashing of glass as if the world was splintering. She ripped open the envelope. Dear Kokoro Anzai, I heard from Mr. Ida that you would be coming to school and she advised me to write a letter to you so I have. I know you hate me, but I would still like to meet you and talk. You must think I'm horrible for suggesting it. I know you are upset by what happened with you know who. But don't worry, I didn't tell Mr. Ida about him. Actually, I broke up with him this summer. I thought if you still like him, I would cheer you on. Signed, Miori, with a smiley face. Her hand shook even harder. What the hell is this? She recalled the laughing, playful banter. Mr. Ida, do you have a girlfriend? Even if I did, I wouldn't tell you. 
She remembered Tojo-san's cold eyes and how she blanked her, and then began to hear her own blood boiling in the veins of her temple. She screwed the letter up tightly and put on her, put on her slippers. She pushed her toes right inside, squashing down the backs of the heels, and headed off to the nurse's office. If she could get there quickly, she would be able to breathe again. She shut her eyes and took a gulp of air, but no matter how many breaths she took, her chest still hurt, and she felt herself drowning all the more. If only she could get to the nurse's office, Masamune would be there. Her friends would be waiting, all of them, all of them. She wanted to show Masamune the letter and hear him say, What a load of crap! What a moron she is! My thoughts exactly, Kokoro thought. Tojo-san had spotted her, so the news that she was at school would surely reach Miyori's ears, and quickly too, lessons had begun, but Kokoro could picture Tojo-san scuttling over to Miyori's desk the moment the bell went. Hey, you know what? She's here! Kokoro felt faint, and I know you hate me, but I would still like to meet you and talk. Her body literally shook. She turned the door handle into the nurse's office. If some of her friends had not turned out, that would be okay. To see just one of their faces would be such a relief. She might break down in tears. She pushed open the door. The nurse was sitting at her desk alone. There was a space heater emitting a red glow. The nurse was seated in front of it. Kokoro knew the school nurse by sight but had never talked to her. She seemed to be expecting Kokoro. Mr. Ida must have let her know. Anzai-san, the nurse said, looking at her in surprise. Is Masamune? She was gasping, her voice reedy and trembling. She looked over to check if anyone was lying on the bed but no one was. Hmm? The nurse said, inclining her head. Masahu? Masamune-kun, in the 8th grade, did, she, did, did he come here today? Which class in 8th grade he was in? He had told her, but her mind was so jumbled, she couldn't recall. Fuka-chan. She was sure in classroom 3, Kokoro's speech sped up. Did, did Fuka-chan in 8th grade classroom 3 come too? And Subaru-kun and Aki-chan both in ninth grade? As she got the words out, she realized that without their last names, the nurse would have no idea who she was talking about. Unless you were particularly close to someone, students didn't call each other by their first names. Kokoro suddenly reddened at having called Masamune by his first name to the nurse, still lingering in the doorway. She decided that if no one appeared, she would go to Subaru's classroom, where he said he would be waiting. She could see him, easy going, cool. Hey, so what's up? He would say. Anzai-san, please don't stress. Come in and sit down, the nurse was saying. And what about Ureshino-kun from 7th grade? Kokoro suddenly remembered that she knew Ureshino's full name. After his incident last year, the teachers must surely remember him. Haruka Ureshino, did he come by to see you today? As she spoke, an uneasiness came over her. Masamune, Aki, Subaru, weren't the teachers surprised all these kids who had been absent for so long suddenly turned up on the same day? Wouldn't their parents contact their homeroom teachers as Kokoro's mother had done with Mr. Ida? The school nurse gazed patiently at Kokoro, a look of confusion in her eyes. Ureshino-kun, she said. I'm sure there's no 7th grader with that name. Kokoro felt a huge gust of wind had struck her. The nurse looked genuinely perplexed. Haruka, Ureshino, an unusual first and last name. She had got to know him. A thought suddenly hit her. What if Ureshino had lied? What if he was the only one who wasn't in, at Yukishina number no. 5 high, sc high school, but had lied about it to go along with others? The school nurse frowned doubtfully. And I don't think anyone with the first name as Masamune in 8th grade either. 
Aki Chang, Fuka Chang. I'm trying to think if I know them. What are their last names? Their last names. Instinctively, she knew. She knew it for certain. Not in her mind, but in her gut. They are not here. Why she knew this? She wasn't sure. She began. She became convinced. She would never be able to see Masamune and the others in their world outside the castle. Masamune, she said quietly, "What am I supposed to do?" And she felt that she was about to cry. What the hell? Are you trying to show me how heroic you are by saying you're going with me, even with all that crap that happened to you? Are you trying to show me how hard it will be for you? She remembered Masamune's snarky reaction. Masamune had agreed to come because he thought they they would all be here too. This means we have all bet- betrayed him. A picture came to her, clear as a bell, as of Masamune alone, dazed in the nurse's office. She felt like making a run for it in search of help, and then someone said her name, Kokoro-chan. It was a soft voice. She turned around. In the doorway stood Miss Kitajima. She reached out a warm hand and touched her shoulder, and all oh, Kokoro's tension drained away. Miss Kitajima. A faint sound came out of her, as if air from deep in her throat was being expelled, and then Kokoro collapsed to the floor. With a crack, everything went black. When she woke up, Miss Kitajima was still there, sitting next to her. Kokoro felt the scratch of the starch bed cover over her. She lay on a bed in the nurse's office. The warmth of the space heater was not far away. She looked around to see if maybe another student was in another bed, but she didn't sense anyone beyond the partition. Are you okay? Miss Kitajima looked into her eyes. I'm okay, Kokoro said, less to report her condition than because she was embarrassed to find someone gazing at her as she lay there defenseless on her back. She had never fainted before. She had no idea how long she had been out. Her throat was parched, her voice hoarse. Miss Kitajima? Yes? Why are you here? Miss Kitajima's smiling eyes met Kokoro's. I came over because your mother told me you would be at school today. I see. She came because she was worried. Kokoro and Miss Kitajima were alone in the office. Miss Kitajima must have been keeping in touch with the teachers at school, coordinating things. Kokoro had already resigned herself to the fact that she would not be seeing the others, but pinning Pining her last hopes on one final question, she asked, Was I the only dropout student that you heard about today? Urashino and Masamune had both said that they had met Miss Kitajima. Miss Kitajima brushed away the head that had fallen over Kokoro's eyes. That's right, she said. She was simply answering the question she was asked and didn't seem to find it all significant. So, you didn't hear anything from Ureshino-kun or Masamune-kun's family? Hmm? Was all Miss Kitajima said in response. Kokoro shut her eyes tight. It was just like the nurse had said. There was no one by those names in the school. Kokoro couldn't believe it. But there it was. Nothing, Kokoro said. So it's true, she thought as her mind reeled out. What had it all meant all these days till now? Was the world of the castle in the mirror not real? Now that she thought about it, it seemed like an all too convenient miracle. How could her bedroom connect so efficiently with a different world? Meeting these kids thinking they were her friends, wasn't it all just wish fulfillment? And then she thought, is there something seriously wrong with me? Masamune, 
and Ureshino, and Aki, and Fuka, and Subaru, and Rion. Has she been living since May? Without realizing it, in this delusion of being with them, when in reality she had been alone the entire time? The thought that she had gone crazy chilled her, but another thought frightened her even more. From tomorrow, I may not be able to go to the castle ever again. Kokoro-chan, I'm sorry, Miss Kitajima said. When you fainted a while ago, you dropped a note, and I'm afraid I saw what it said. Kokoro bit her lip, and the contents of the letter came rushing back. The rounded handwriting on the envelope. Miori calling herself horrible. The boy she referred to obliquely as you know who was of course Chuta Ikeda. Kokoro didn't care that he might have been Miori's boyfriend or that they had broken up. They didn't understand each other at all, Kokoro had realized despairingly. What Kokoro had been through and the way Miori Sanada saw things didn't mesh at all. Had they even happened in the same world? She agonized over whether to come today, thinking she might be killed, and there was Miori settling the whole matter by saying, in a throwaway fashion of a boy that Kokoro had nothing to do with, I thought if you still like him, I'll cheer you on. Kokoro couldn't put into words how frustrating it made her feel. It was so humiliating. Her insights felt like they were on fire. I want to kill her, she thought. She shut her eyes at as tears of frustration swelled up. I spoke to Mr. Ida a few minutes ago. Miss Kitajima was saying, the letter doesn't really address what went on. Her tone sounded unusually stern. Kokoro kept her face covered with her forearm. Tears felt hot on her sleeve. I'm sorry, Miss Kitajima said. Kokoro had never expected a teacher to apologize. Miss Kitajima, <laughs> Moe Tonjo was there a little while ago. Her convulsive breathing made the words come out in fits and starts. She was at the school entrance and saw me and she blanked me. She didn't say a thing. She used to bring letters from school to my house every day. But when she actually sees me, she ignores me. Kokoro wasn't sure what she was trying to say, but she was sad. So terribly, terribly sad. And her chest felt like it was going to burst apart. Kokoro almost shouted, Miss Kitajima, if it was Moe who put that letter in my kilby hole, what should I do? If Miori asked her to, and Moe did as she was told. As she spoke, she understood what she was really afraid of. What she hated here. Last April, when the kids surrounded her house, Kokoro hadn't been able to verify if Moe was among them. She might have been, but the very thought was too painful, and she wanted to cling to the possibility that Moe had not been there. She couldn't bear the thought that Moe had turned into an enemy. She hadn't been willing to think Moe hated her until today. Kokoro-chan! Miss Kitajima clutched Kokoro's arm so hard she let out a little cry. Then she brought her face right up close. It's okay. Miss Kitajima gripped on her arm was so firm, Kokoro felt encouraged. It's okay. Mr. Ida told Sanada-san to put the note in the cubie hole. Tojo-san had nothing to do with it. I mean... Tojo-san was the one who explained to me what has been going on. Kokoro had been sure that none of the kids who hung out with Miori would ever dare betray their ringleader. But if it was Tojo-san, then she bumped into you so suddenly, so perhaps she was too surprised to speak. But believe me, Tojo-san is worried about you, truly worried about you. But why? Kokoro couldn't help, still wondering. 
if she was that worried, then why look the other way? But at the same time, a part of her felt that she already knew the reason because she felt guilty. Tojo Sang must have been among the kids who surrounded her house. After all, she was there. Yet, she didn't try to stop them. Now she feel extremely bad about it. The possibility made Kokoro feel she could breathe a little. Kokoro-chan, Miss Kitajima said. Kokoro had stopped crying. There's no need for you to fight. The words sounded like a foreign language. Eyes shut tight. She didn't know how to respond and just gave a firm nod. The very idea that she didn't need to fight made her whole body envelop in peace. When she next opened her eyes, she felt more in control of herself. Miss Kitajima was gazing at her, and Kokoro gazed back. What I want to do is go home, Miss Kitajima nodded. Her mother came home from work to pick her up. The nurse had apparently contacted her just after Kokoro fainted. Kokoro lay down on the sofa while her mother sat silently beside her. Half an hour later, Miss Kitajima came by. She had wheeled Kokoro's bike back. Then she explained the reason Tojo-san was at school entrance later than usual was because she felt a cold coming on and had stopped by, the, by at the pharmacy on her way to school. That's all Miss Kitajima told her, nothing more. Kokoro suddenly remembered. Mr. Ida had wanted Miyori and Kokoro to speak to each other. Didn't Miss Kitajima went Kokoro and Tojo-san to see each other too? Kokoro's mother asked her to go upstairs while she and Miss Kitajima talked over things alone for a while. Kokoro took a deep breath and looked hesitantly up the stairs. After the event of the morning, she was now afraid of going into her room. There's no 7th grader with that name. The nurse had not looked like she was lying. Did it mean that everything that happened in the castle was in Kokoro's head? If the illusion was undone, then wouldn't the mirror stop shining? Kokoro climbed the stairs and boldly pushed open the door. She gasped. The mirror was shining she remembered how they had all promised each other what to do if the nurse's office didn't work then they'll go to the library if the library was out then the music room and if none of those work they would make a run for it they promised to run away from school and come back through the mirror to the castle and her mirror was calling out that promise to go Downstairs, her mother and Miss Kitajima were still talking. Kokoro didn't know how long they would take, and they might suddenly ask her to join them. It was entirely possible. She, if she didn't answer, they would think it's odd and come upstairs to look, but still, her desire to go through the mirror was even stronger. She placed her hand on the mirror, and as ever, her palm fitted perfectly, as if being sucked through the surface of water, she split out her fingers and sank into the glow. Everyone will be there, she told herself. Kabi? Ah, Kabi hole. Sorry, English is my second language. Bear cup, cubby, cubby. I thought it's like a cube. Cube hole. Cubby hole. Okay. I get it now. Thank you. On the other side of the mirror, the castle was silent. None of the other mirrors was shining. Oh. No one is here yet, she thought. She looked over at Masamune's mirror, reflecting the grand staircase. Please come, I'm begging you. I went to the school. I really did go to see Masamune. I didn't betray him. He set off for the game room. 
the castle really does exist, she thought. She stroked the walls and fingered the candlesticks, tested the soft red carpeting with her toes. This is no illusion, but what is this place? Kokoro looked around her again. A fireplace no one could use, a kitchen and a bathroom also unusable. All oh, the facilities were here, but with no gas or water. It was more like a toy she had played with as a child. After wandering for a while, she came to the dining room. She reached out to the, touch the brick fireplace in the middle of, of the firewall. Cool to the touch, it felt real. She suddenly thought of the wishing key. She remembered finding an axe mark inside the fireplace. Did it carry something special? She peered inside. The axe, about the size of her palm, was still there. Kokoro! A voice said behind her. Kokoro's shoulders leapt. She spun around. Leon! You surprised me! I saw your mirror shining, but you weren't in the game room. So how did it go? Were you able to meet up with Masamune and the rest? Leon's tone was cheerful. Kokoro gazed steadily at him. He really exists, she thought. He's here, alive, moving, talking. I didn't see them. In her own mind, she sounded like a ghost talking. Rion was clearly puzzled and she had no idea how to explain it. I don't know why, but they weren't there. It, but it wasn't just that they didn't turn up. I was told there weren't any students called Masamune or Ureshino. What? Rion frowned. What do you mean? It helped you... It, it helped that his tone was light. What's the story? Were they making it all up? Claiming that they were in the same junior high? No. The same thought had occurred to her, but there were a lot of things this fact wouldn't explain. First of all, there was no reason for them to do that. I don't know, Kokoro said, breathing hard. She needed to get back soon. There was no telling when her mother and Miss Kitajima might finish their conversation and come upstairs to look for her. Rion might have picked up her impatience. He was silent. Kokoro found it hard to wrench herself away, but she had to. I have to go, she said. My mom's at home today, and I don't know if I don't go back, she'll think something's up. She looked intently at Leon. I'm glad to have seen you. I was thinking perhaps everything is an is a delusion. I'm glad I can see you really exist, Leon. What are you talking about? He was clearly confused. Her hasty explanation wasn't enough. It only served to bewilder her. She regretted it. Where are we? The castle, the wolf queen, what is it all about? She had to leave quickly. But... What she really wanted to do was to call the Wolf Queen, get to get her to give them some answers. Ria murmured, I was thinking too, the whole thing feels a bit fake. What do you mean? The way the Wolf Queen calls us the little red riding hoods. He paused. I gotta go too. I snuck out during a timeout from football practice. I thought today was going to be an important battle for you all and I had to find out how it went. What time is it in Hawaii? About 5.30 in the afternoon. Rion had his own tight daily schedule, but was concerned enough about all, them, all of them to come over. Kokoro began to feel less tense. A question suddenly occurred to her that she had just had to, ha that she had had to ask. She and Rion seldom got a chance to talk to their own. So this feel... So this was her one opportunity. What do you do, Leon? If it was you, do? If you found the wishing key, Leon's eyes looked clear, as if gazing off into the distance. My wishes. Kokoro didn't wa want to hear what his wish was. Having a wish come true meant everyone here would lose their memory. So she was expecting him to say that he didn't care for the key if it meant he would lose his memory. But instead, he carried on. Please bring my older sister back home. Their eyes met. Rion's lips trembled, as if he had surprised himself by saying it out loud. 
Kokoro had no idea what to say. The Rion gave a resigned smile. The year I started elementary school, my sister died. She was sick. Kokoro was suddenly filled with pity. She looked in she looked patiently at Rion, willing him to continue. Sorry, I'm sure you don't want to hear this. I'm not expecting to respond or anything. No, it's okay. Did Rion want to talk about his dead sister or not? She couldn't tell. She didn't think he would pick up her thoughts, but he gave a relief smile and went on. If there really is a wishing key, my sister can come back, then I might use it. If any wish can come true. Oh, I see you mean. I see what you mean. I haven't talked about this for a long time. I've never told it to any of my friends at school over there. Seeing how uncomfortable he was, Kokoro stayed stock still. She felt a lump in her throat and thought, I am so terribly small. In the face of Rion's wish, her problem with Miori Sanada faded. What a pathetically small thing I have been wishing for, she thought. She felt her heart beating audibly within her. If he should, his wish can come true, I'm willing to give up my own. Will you be here tomorrow? Rion asked. I will. She realized she had to dash back in case her mother's conversation with Miss Kitajima had finished, but all she could think of right now was that they really existed. And when she saw the others the next day, she could be completely sure of it. Her mother didn't, didn't bring up her conversation with Miss Kitajima, and so Kokoro waited patiently for the next day when they could all see each other again. When she passed through the mirror the next morning, they were indeed there, all except Masamune and Rion. Rion's timetable was such that she, he couldn't spend all day in the castle like the others, but Masamune's absence was significant. Kokoro! When she arrived at the game room, it was Aki who first spoke to her. She looked a little angry. They must already have been discussing something, Kokoro thought. She came in silent and they stared at her. Why weren't you there? Aki said. She had known the question was coming, but now that she had actually heard it, the shock was greater than she imagined. I was, she said. She looked directly at Aki. I was there. I went to school just like we promised. And right then, a possibility crossed her mind. Maybe all the others did meet up. All of them except Kokoro had met in the nurse's office. Everyone but her. Was it? Was that all it was? If so, to them it meant Kokoro had betrayed them. Aki's eyes narrowed. She looked at, over at Fuka. Are you telling me the same thing? What? The same thing as Kokoro and Subaru. Kokoro gaps and looked at Fuka and Subaru for confirmation. They nodded. Ureshina's face turned bright red. I was there too. He chimed in. Kokoro felt her shoulders go limp. Kokoro. Thank you. <laughs> This stretch. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my god. I gotta be more active. Okay, hang on. Give me one second. Let me stand up and stretch a bit.
That feels better. Alright. <sighs> Kokoro felt her shoulders go limp. Ureshino had made the trek back to school. That must have taken some courage. Me too. And me. But I didn't see any of you, Fuka said. So that was it. It happened to every single one of them. They had definitely been to school yesterday, but for some reason they couldn't meet up. They told me there's no 7th grader called Kokoro, Ureshino said. Kokoro is an, Kokoro is an unusual name. I asked a teacher who was passing by, but he said there was no one called Kokoro at school. I asked too, and they said there was no one in 7th grade called Haruka Ureshino. Ureshino's face clouded over. I'm real, you know. Me too. I'm in 7th grade at Yukishina number 5 junior high. Subaru, standing there with his arm folded, said, Me too. I went to my ninth grade classroom, and I waited and waited, but Masamune never appeared. So I went over to his classroom, but he wasn't there either. A hush came over them. What's going on? Aki asked. To no one in particular, she ran her fingers roughly over her hair in frustration. Kokoro noticed her hair color changed again. Her reddish dyed hair had gone back to black. So she could go to school. She probably dyed black the night before after she got home from the castle. Aki wasn't making it up. Like Kokoro, she had set her mind on going to school and indeed she had. Even though I didn't want to see the girls from the volleyball club. Aki seemed to murmur this unintentionally. She spoke so faintly, so weakly that it was painful to hear. So, Aki was a member of the volleyball club? This was news to Kokoro. This past eight months, she had never mentioned it. Her frail tone sent a sharp pain racing through Kokoro. The volleyball club. Miyori Sanada's Volleyball Club Had Aki still been going to school when Miyori started the club? Could Aki, so close to her now, be that girl senpai? Shall we ask the Wolf Queen? Fuka suggested. All eyes turned to her. She might be able to explain what's going on. Then again, she might not, just to be tricky. We could. But shouldn't we ask Masamune first? Subaru said. Kokoro agreed. They all look over at Masamune's game controller, lying idle. Masamune may not be here today, but the same thing must have happened to him. He couldn't meet us, right? Actually, I would like your advice on something. I was wondering if you all could come to school just for one day. One day would be enough. Kokoro recalled how timidly Masamune had broached the, to the, the topic. Her chest ached as she remembered how he had prepared Christmas presents for them and how hard it must have been for him, with all his pride, to ask for this favor. He was so desperate for them to be there, and yet they weren't. How had Masamune had taken it? Do you think he misunderstood what happened? Fuka said. Her eyes were sad, thinking that none of us had turned up? I think so. And if that's why he isn't here, that totally sucks. M maybe it's just coincidence he's not here. Perhaps he'll appear this afternoon. Ureshino shook his head. Maybe when he went they beat him up. I'm just thinking of what happened to me. They had been ho holding out hope that Masamune would slip through his mirror in the grand foyer and show up any minute now, but that didn't hap seem to happen. It felt like his unspoken anger lingered, and it pained Kokoro. Please come, Masamune. That was everyone's wi silent wish. They stayed around in the castle, waiting. After a while, they heard someone come in and glance up, but it was Rion. Looking in on them from the hallway. Where's Masamune? It hurt to hear how casually he asked. He hasn't come, Subaru said. 
They all attempted to explain the events of previous day. What do we do if he doesn't come back? Kokoro asked if it was, it was approaching the end of the day. It'll be okay, Subaru said. Video games are his life. At least he'll come back to pick up his game console. He looked over at Masamune's device lying untouched on the floor. But Masamune didn't appear. Not that day. Or the next. Or the next. Or the next. That is the end of January of the overall third chapter. <coughs> How's everyone doing? Hello there, readers, I mean, listeners, viewers, guys, girls, they, them, everyone. That was the end of it. Perfectly time at two hours. Actually, it was perfect because I rambled a lot in the beginning of the live stream about stuff that doesn't really matter. <laughs> okay. Doing good? Oh, thank you, Sam, for dropping by today. I really appreciate it. So, I my guess is that your off day is on... Uh, Thursday? Is that right? <laughs> oh Yeah, okay, so just so you guys know I am planning uh, To go to Australia um, To visit Sam and Strudel um, but uh, the Australian government hates uh, the people from my country because uh, there are a lot of bad apples who overstay their welcome. Um, I have submitted my uh, paperwork for the ETA. It's not visa. It's just like a. It's just an ETA to enter Australia. <laughs> but uh, uh, apparently, I have been reading a lot of like um, forums that. People are having trouble getting the ETA to enter uh, Australia right now. Um, some of them take weeks, some of them take months to get the ETA. So I can't, I can't buy the tickets. <laughs> I can't buy the tickets just yet because I can't. Uh, I I don't know if I will get the ETA, you know. Uh, but I promise you. Sam, that will hang out in person, alright? Um, I, I can make the trip. COVID stuff is fine. I'm not worried about that. It's more that uh, the Australian government are very wary of the people from my country. Um, because there were a lot of cases where they uh, um, took, take, took advantage of the asylum thing. And also, uh, overstay their welcome, you know. So, they are very wary of that. Um, but I have personally visited um, Australia twice, and I made it back home. But that was about ten, almost ten years ago. I hope they would take account to that that I'm not. I have no intention to overstay my welcome. Uh, but yeah, the, the intention right now that I have is to visit Australia for, uh, I don't know how long, maybe a couple of weeks, maybe more than a couple of weeks, I don't know. Uh, as long as Strudel can host me in his uh, smelly home. <laughs> so yeah, um... That's my plan, basically. 
not um but I, I have to wait for my ETA to like I'm 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 so nervous and and like frustrated that I'm like checking it on like a like on a daily basis like it, it I probably open the app to check it like every day basically uh like every few hours I would like look into it that's it's not approved yet so I hope I'm I I'm just hoping that I'm one of those that they 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 think that ah she's fine that she can just come in <laughs> <You know? laughs> I don't know it's hard it's tough it's tough um otherwise uh, I remember back in those days when I went to Aussie land uh it just takes me like less than 24 hours to get the ETA to enter I basically applied it like like two days before I fly and uh and I got it like within 24 hours but it has been um uh, almost half a week now and I'm still waiting I don't know how long it will take but I will make it down there don't worry and I will and uh, Strudel did say that he can plan to pick me up from the airport um maybe with you then you guys can bring me to eat like authentic Australian food like I don't know what I don't know man I just like at this point I just want to get the fuck out of where I am at least for a while you know um I'm so sick of being where I am right now I, I want I want to go somewhere I want to meet new people and mo I want to meet new friends I want to hang out with you guys I want to I meet people who I have really good conversation with I want to meet Strudel uh, I want to mess with his hair and make him and tie his hair into like twin buns uh, I don't know stuff uh, there's a lot I want to do I don't know. I just want to get out. I don't just. I just want to get the fuck out. <laughs> At least for a while. Escape escapism. I don't know. I just want to hang out with you guys. I don't know. Just chill. You know what I mean. And I'm sure you know what I mean. Just chill. Maybe you guys can bring me to party. I've never partied in my life. Oh my god, we should do that. Hell yeah. That's so true. Oh my god. Like, make him wear a French braid or something. Jesus, that would be so funny. Oh god. Yeah. Hell yeah. That, But that would mean a face reveal for me on uh, Strudel's stream. That's no good. I'll have to wear like a... A full on uh, furry outfit or something. So that I won't have a face reveal, right? <laughs> the fuck am I talking about? <laughs> but yeah, I'm excited. I, I, I am. I'm definitely excited to get the fuck out of here. Just Australian. Please. Government, please give me the ETA. All I need to do now is just fucking... Oh yeah, that's right, I can wear a mask. I have a mask. I have a I have a half face mask. A, um, a cat mask. I'm gonna be a Mikote on stream. And that is true. That is true. I don't know, it's like... I just hope that they can give me the ETA, like we didn't... Like, I would, like, my plan is just go there in July, like, end of this month or July or something like that for a couple weeks or something like that. I don't fucking know. Like, just your government, man. Yes, hell yeah. I don't think you'll annoy me. I think, I think the chances of me annoying you will be higher. But then, I'm also very fucking awkward in person, so I don't know. It'll be, it'll be like, like a convention of awkward people. I know I'm awkward, but probably pseudo will not make me awk like I wouldn't I don't know. I don't fucking know actually. It'll be awkward. I think I will be awkward. 
because I'm I'm generally awkward in person. So I don't fucking know, man. <laughs> I don't know. I just want to get out. It's I just fucking hope that your government let me in, man. Anyway, so much ranting. Yes, but I'll be yes, I'll be visiting down south, the Aussie land in the winter. After that will be spring, right? And it's still winter right now. It's fucking cold. I have to like go and get all the thick clothing out from my. Luggage, my travel outfits. <laughs> oh my god, your government! Why? I I I I understand completely why they restrict us. It's just that I'm frustrated with the bad apples from my country who's ruining shit for the rest of us. Who actually just want to visit, you know? You know what I mean? Okay. I'll see you later. I'll vent about this later. <laughs> Bye, Sam. Thank you for dropping by. Have fun. Also, for the rest of you, thank you so much for being here with me, listening to me read, listening to me talk about shit. Um... Uh, 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 venting about how people know the movies and not know the filmmakers. Uh, today's topic is basically, do you know Makoto Shinkai? Um, and also watch um if you like Makoto Shinkai's current stuff, which I never watch because I don't really care for his work. Uh, watch. Five centimeters per second. Uh, the only Makoto Shinkai film that I watch in my life. Um, and also, if uh, you have a cinema near you and it's still playing everything, everywhere, all at once, uh, starring Michelle Yeoh, directed and written by the Daniels, please. Go and watch that film. It's crazy. It's funny. It's poignant. It's uh, heart wrenching. It's everything. It's it's everything everywhere all at once. So, um, tomorrow, I will not be reading, <laughs> unfortunately, because I have a pottery class where I'll be painting. Uh, the bisque that I made. Um, I will be streaming IRL, uh, where you'll watch me paint my bisque wares. Uh, I hope you guys will tune in and chat with me while I'm um, painting because it's sad if I'm just alone painting there. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. in real live stream, I will, I'll be painting pottery bisque pieces that I made myself uh, past uh, two weeks ago and stuff. Last month. Um, uh, la, 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 and on uh, Saturday, 2 p.m., I'll be streaming Yakuza 6. I think you guys might be interested in watching that. Uh, if you guys have not seen me play Yakuza 6, there is a VOD. On my channel, uh, twitch.tv slash Ariana Luna, or you can go to my YouTube channel, um, which I don't have <laughs> a proper link yet because I don't have ha 100 subscribers yet. YouTube is another beast, so uh, 
need time to like properly get that done as well but yeah watch my vods on uh, yakuza 6 and see if you like my commentary while i'm playing that game um i think i'm funny sometimes sometimes not all the times but uh yeah there are some clips in uh, my twitch channel as well while i was playing the uh, uh yakuza 6 but yeah that will be on saturday but tomorrow there will be no nudibles. Uh, unfortunately, there's only two nudibles this week because tomorrow I'm going to paint. I'm babbling because I don't know what the hell I'm doing with my life. Um, anyway, no nudibles tomorrow. IRL stream tomorrow. Me painting, painting my beastware that I make. Saturday stream Yakuza Six Songs of Life. Um, until then. Enjoy your Thursday. Uh, be healthy, be safe, be happy, be loved, and love. Oh, Neuro, I knew that you are lurking there. I knew it, you lurking little bastard. Hell yeah. <sighs> Thank you for being here with me, you guys. I really appreciate every single day, every single time I stream. I uh, can't express enough how much I appreciate your company with me. Um, it's been a really, really rough couple of weeks and I, um, I'm glad you guys still stick around even though I took an entire week off uh, and I am very happy. That you guys are here with me today. <sighs> Thank you. And I'm ending my stream now. And I'll see you guys tomorrow. IRL stream. <laughs> Have a good day. Bye. I love you all.